I've been looking forward to this talk a great deal uh, because I think this is an effort to uh, grapple very directly with the term itself that we're talking about, resilience, not applied to any one discipline, but the concept. And uh, our title for Jesse's talk, which I, I, I actually haven't discussed with Jesse whether he takes issue with it or not, because we want it to be cheeky, so we're calling it resilience and the sustainability of buzzwords, in acknowledgement that there's a certain you know, element of, of things getting in vogue and, and becoming fads around these terms. But as I mentioned earlier, I think for, for some serious good reasons, but we want it. Jesse, who is the editor at large at the Oxford English Dictionary and a frequent contributor to Slate, our, our other partner in the future tense venture, to uh, riff a little bit on, on what it means for buzzwords like resilience to spill over into the broader culture. And I'm not sure exactly where all you're going to take us, but I'm, I'm eager to see. So, Jesse, it's yours. Thanks very much. Um, I took you at your word that this is what you wanted me, wanted me to talk about. So, in fact, I did talk about the sustainability of buzzwords. Um, I hope that's okay. Um, uh, because they are actually sustainable, uh, even if it's in an unpredictable way. Um, just to get some definitions uh, off the bat first, uh, resilience itself is an interesting word. It comes from a Latin word that ultimately means something like, uh, the etymological meaning, something like the act of avoiding, uh, uh, strange, strangely enough. Um, but the usual senses it's developed in Latin and other languages that, uh, that it's come into um, are something a little bit different. The earliest sense here in English, which is uh, first found in uh, 1626 from Francis Bacon, is uh, the action or an act of rebounding or springing back. You know, rebound, recoil, this is an obsolete sense. It was uh, in use a little bit in the 19th century, but hasn't really been seen since. Um, the technical sense uh, is elasticity, the power of resuming an original shape or position after compression, bending, etc. cetera. Uh, and this is the material science sense that uh, Professor Vanderloo mentioned earlier. Um, this is more recent, it dates from the early 19th century. Um, and the main modern use, which is a figurative sense of this, is more recent still. Uh, so is this... Uh, oop. There we go, sorry. Um, this is sense five in, in OED. Uh, unless I otherwise say the definitions I give here are from the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and also, of course, we see that we do have four senses before this that we don't bother to cover because uh, you know, this is the subtleties of the use over time. Um, but sense five is the quality or fact of being able to recover quickly or easily from or resist being f affected by a misfortune, shock, illness, etc., uh, robustness or adaptability. Um, the earliest example uh, we have of this uh, is from 1657. This is just a, a, a apparently unremarkable book of history, but that writes, uh, in their struggles with the ponderous power of England, uh, the Scots discovered an invincible vigor not only of resistance, but of resilience. Um, now, even this use remained relatively uncommon for some time. Uh, in the next slide, we can get a sense of just how buzzy this word is. Um, you know, as with many words that can vaguely fit into the category of, you know, businessy sorts of terms, resilience has had a more or less stable profile until around 1970, uh, when it really takes off. Um, now, I don't know if people are familiar with um, with the use of the Google Ngram uh, engine, which is uh, a straightforward, and easy to use. Uh, tool for things that can be uh, done a lot more sophisticatedly uh, using some other things, but, but uh, just you know, punch something right in and, and, and see what you have. And here, this is a chart of resilience from uh, 1840 or so to 2000. And you know, a small peak around uh, 1940 or so, but really around you know, 1970 and you know, 1980, it really starts, uh, starts taking off. Um, of course, it's not possible to get an exact breakdown of the senses from this kind of graph. This is just the search of you know, the word itself, but you know, a hand inspection of, of some of these examples shows that it's clearly our meaning uh, that we're talking about here that's, uh, that's overwhelmingly common in this era. Um, now, the other word, uh, the other notable word here is the word buzzword itself. Um, the earliest example uh, that anyone has found of, of buzzword uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, curiously enough, an article in the Linguistics Journal American Speech uh, written about uh, the, quote, specialized vocabulary of, wait for it, uh, students at the Graduate School of Business Administration at Harvard University. Um, and this was a very short article. Uh, it took up less than half a page and was not uh, primarily analysis, just pointing out some interesting things that had been found. 
Um, and the article goes through a number of jargon terms that were in use at, uh, at HBS, uh, including uh, ceremonialize, uh, discusses that the student should know, quote, the value of using a crisis situation, most of these words are in italics or in quotes in the article, uh, the, uh, using a crisis situation for teaching, uh, the student should marshal his evidence. Um, if his analysis does not highlight the most important problems, he has poor focus, and if he fails to emphasize important recommendations, he will be accused of tinkering. Um, if the sequence for the implementation of the recommendations is not good, it is a matter of poor timing. Excuse me. Um, and to succeed, the student must, quote, get on top of the problem, must not shadow box, uh, and if he can't, he might just as well turn in his suit. Um, and so this was an article in December 1946. Within the next two years, American Speech had published a number of additional articles about buzzwords in other contexts. So clearly they liked the concept very much at the time um, of buzzwords. Um, so looking at the definition itself, there are two definitions, uh, interestingly enough, that, that often sit, uh, sit uneasily together. Um, the meaning, uh, the meaning of in the American speech article is uh, sense one here, an important sounding, usually technical word or phrase, often of little meaning, used chiefly to impress laymen. Um, um, and I have to give credit elsewhere. This definition is actually taken from uh, Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. The OED entry for buzzword was written a number of decades ago and hasn't yet been revised. So uh, um, I will use that excellent definition there. Um, often, uh, uh, we are, however, are talking about sense two, uh, which is simply a fashionable expression, a vogue word. Um, so, and many of these overlap, but for example, uh, to take examples of things that are very clearly one or the other, um, Web 2.0 is very clearly sense one. You know, no one knows what it means, it doesn't mean anything, it changes every week, uh, you know. Um, but, but sense two, uh, an example would be, let's say, where's the beef? Um, you know, Vogue word, you know, in use of TV commercial, political context a little bit, now it's strictly historical, you know, no one would say this and not, uh, and not look stupid. Um, so by, um, you know, so by definition, sense two uh, can't be resilient. Um, you know, if a word sticks around, it's no longer a vogue word, it's just a word, and if it goes away, well, then uh, it's not resilient. Um, but in practice, of course, there is some overlap here. So, you know, a buzzword is a vogue word that is also a disliked one or one that is felt to have little meaning, um, and often the dislike of words of this sort remains uh, even after the voguishness goes away. Um, so, so what about the stickiness of terms like this? You know, what is their resilience? Um, in fact, the, the reality is that once words get a foothold in the language, they tend to stay around rather longer than is expected. Um, this is true across many, many uh, parts of language. Um, but the most striking one is actually the resilience of slang, which is often felt uh, one, one of the main myths. There are many myths about slang, you know, that it's a code that kids use to you know, confuse their parents, all sorts of things. Um, most things you know about slang are, in fact, not true. Um, and one of the things you know about slang that is not true is that it's especially evanescent, you know, that once a slang word reaches any kind of broad circulation, it either falls out of use or it becomes standard English. Um, and uh, this is not the case. A few examples uh, of, of very, very many. Um, uh, the word booze referring to alcohol is still considered relatively slangy. This goes back to the 16th century. It's borrowing from Dutch. Um, chops referring to the mouth or the lips, 17th century. Um, you know, my favorite example, only because it's it's you know in such dramatically common use, and no one uh, no one ever regards this as not slang, is the word cool in you know, more or less a sense fashionable, which depending on on how you look at the evidence goes back to the 1920s or 30s, but certainly by the 1940s, the modern sense. Uh, is in use, very common, and it never goes out of fashion. You know, the word cool has been cool you know, since the 1940s. It has never been considered not slang. Uh, I think most people now would regard it as slang, so, um, and, and we keep using it. Um, similarly, and, and even longer, although its, it's history is uh, somewhat more complicated, is the word hip um, or hep. Uh, they arise at almost the exact same time, around 1902, 1903. Um, you know, where its use has changed over time, but, you know, has been more or less in use for a uh, hundred years, for over a hundred years, uh, remains slang, and, you know, whatever we argue about what it means, you know, what hipsters are, this sort of thing, uh, the technical parts don't really matter. The point is it's still considered you know, a more or less fashionable word. It's still around. And uh, my favorite example, which is a little bit outdated now, um, but um, fat, P-H-A-T, um, which got some attention in the late 80s, early 90s as, as, a, as a rap term, um, 
meaning fashionable or sexy. Uh, the earliest example uh, people have found of this is uh, 1963, uh, which was in fact an article in Life magazine uh, about uh, what was called Negro jargon and listed several uh, uh, adjectives of approval, which included mellow, fat, spelled P-H-A-T, um, cool, and boss. Uh, in fact, the use of fat spelled F-A-T, meaning something almost the same, goes back to the, the early 19th century. Uh, so, you know, it's the spelling alone that people think is, you know, oh, that's so very new. But, um, you know, but, you know, but even that's rather old, and, and, and the sense itself goes back even farther than that. Um, but even, uh, even non-slang examples, you know, the things that seem very recent can be a lot older than expected. So, uh, so, you know, internet abbreviations or texting abbreviations, depending on what you call them, you know, many of these are not all that new. So uh, IMHO goes back to the early 1980s. Um, LOL goes to the late 1980s. Um, OMG for Oh My God goes back to the 1910s. Um, <laughs> Um, the first two, IMHO and LOL, do both appear uh, first in, in context of electronic communication, but but you know, but a long way away. This is you know decades already. These are not things that you know just came up last year. Um, so what about things that are more typically regarded as buzzwords? Um, I gathered a few terms randomly. That is, I wasn't specifically looking for ones that that are old. Um, and, uh, and here are some examples of things, and, and also looking at lists of you know, what people describe as buzzwords or what people say you know, they don't like. Um, so a few examples, um, paradigm shift, conceptual or methodological change in the theory or practice of a particular science or discipline, uh, more usually in the extended sense, uh, any major change in technology, outlook, et cetera. Um, you know, this is, of course, from Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, you know, 1962, very old, very well established. Um, Content provider, uh, a person who or organization that furnishes the matter or substance relayed in an act of communication, specifically a company that writes or produces material for dissemination by another agency via any of various frequently electronic media. Um, you know, this seems like the archetypal you know, term of the internet age. Uh, in fact, the earliest example of this also, 1962, um, in this sense. Uh, you know, the sense specific, you know, the, the very specific sense referring to only to electronic media comes later, um, but that, but not all that much later. You, you know, even by the 1980s, you know, content itself, uh, meaning material produced by content providers, let's say, uh, you know, material, you know, irrespective of how it's produced, um, in computing contests context by 1982. Uh, again, long before the era where people think, well, you know, we're completely dominated by computers, and you know, everything we do is, you know, is, is online. Um, you know, that, that's how old a lot of these terms are. Um, prioritize, one of the widely disliked terms um, to give priority to. Um, first example of this, it's probably earlier than this now, um, 1954, uh, and in that very first example it is described as firmly embedded in the speech of government workers. Um, which, of course, not only suggests that it's much older, but this is why people don't like, you know, people don't like terms associated with, you know, one or another disliked group, uh, and I'll get to another example of that later. Um, in the same sort of family as prioritize, um, finalized, by the way, goes back much, much uh, uh, longer, um, but incentivized, you know, to motivate, you know, to provide an incentive for, et cetera. Um, first example of that, 1968, you know, well over 40 years old. Um, even the shortening in cent, 1977, you know, this is not a very new thing. Um, impact, people, you know, if anyone wants to dislike that impact, uh, you know, meaning to affect, let's say, goes back to the 1950s. Um, exit strategy, plan for withdrawal, early 1970s, um, proactive. Uh, you know, innovative, let's just say, um, goes back to 1951. Uh, the early examples do tend to be from books about the psychology of leadership, so, you know, business, you know, business or psycho psychological sense even then, but, uh, you know, but very old. Um, one of the disliked uh, examples you come across all the time to think outside of the box. Um, and everything related to that inside the box, out of the box thinking and so forth. Uh, Again, over 40 years old here, 1971 is the first example that we know of this. Um, so that's just a whole pile of, of examples, which really were relatively random. I didn't go looking for things that, that are older than you think, although I did avoid things that were you know, very, very strictly uh, you know, connected to the most modern internet developments. Um, all of the, these, are, these are old, you know, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s for most of these, and even in the case of the computer-related ones, you know, the very early 1980s at latest. Um, 
So what is the purpose of them? You know, what is the purpose of buzzy words? Um, do they have a purpose? Well, buzzy words are useful uh, to distinguish buzzy things. Um, obviously, you know, when, when things fall out of use or become so incorporated that they're familiar, you know, we don't need the word anymore. You know, that, that's how things become non-buzzy. Uh, people ask all the time, well, you know, what words do you take out of the dictionary? Um, the OED never removes words, but that's a separate thing. I mean, the, the purpose of the, the OED is historical, so uh, if something was part of the language in the 16th century, we want to know about it and we will keep it in. Um, so once we make, once we make and, and we're historical document in itself, once we include something, it stays in. But for trade dictionaries, uh, that is you know, the regular one volume things you buy in a bookstore, uh, or used to buy in a bookstore, um, uh, <laughs> You know, people say, well, when do you take words out, out, or what are examples of things that you've removed? They're never interesting. That is, once you've decided to pull them out, it's because you haven't heard them, you know, because they're a name for something that you didn't even know ever existed, or you know, for, for any various reasons, that, you know, they don't exist and you don't care about them, so you take them out. So journalists are always disappointed when you give them anything that you've removed from recent editions. Um, but or they can become incorporated or just you know, become not all that interesting anymore. So. Uh, Information superhighway, you know, computing and telecommunications, a router network for the high-speed transfer of information, especially a proposed national fiber optic network in the United States, or B, the internet. Um, I would first of all point out in passing, this goes back to the early 1980s as well. Um, but now this is a part of our life. We don't need a florid term like this. Uh, you know, you know, when we didn't have the internet, when most people weren't on the internet, you know, this sounded like an interesting metaphor and it was something we could talk about and Al Gore and invented the internet and all this. Um, but, uh, but now there was, we wouldn't use a term like this. We're all online all the time. We don't have to talk about it in this way. Um, so at this point, and much more recently, um, tweet, let's say, you know, tweet is not a buzzword either. It's just a word. You know, no one talks about tweeting. No one uses the word tweet to show off, to be humorous, to call attention to anything. And people don't use it to mock this newfangled thing that you know, those people use, but that no one else really gets either. You know, there's no other term for it. It's what we do. And that's the end of it. You know, two, years ago, thanks, uh, two years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, but you know, things can change rapidly with technological developments. Um, and a similar comparison, slightly older, but relevant for this, is you know, the use of Google as a verb. Um, this started getting media attention in uh, mid-2001, but you could find examples in 1999, you know, barely after Google itself launched. Um, this is a relative eternity, given the state of internet search technology at the time. Um, even in this case, uh, pretty much all of the examples from 2001 are, are rewrites or references uh, to a single New York Times article about, uh, about using Google to find information on, on, on one's dates. Um, but even by 2003, we were pretty much done seeing general media write, uh, running articles saying, ooh, yes, it's a verb. Um, so going back to the difference between types of buzzwords and their purpose, um, here's a very classic, uh, although recent example of, of one view of this. Oops. Uh, sorry. Uh, slid off the page a little bit there. Sorry. Um, this is a, a Dilbert cartoon. Um, Manager says, moving forward, we'll go after the low-hanging fruit at the end of the day. Ha, ha, ha. I like the way you used humor to mock the vacuous way managers speak. Uh, you know, which part was humor? And uh, he's saying, uh, I'll be quiet now, um, I think. Um, so this goes back to my point earlier about disliked buzzwords um, you know, being associated with some disliked minority group, uh, in this case, corporate managers. Um, and that they are considered to be meaningless. Uh, but when you look at this in detail, uh, not only looking at the history of, of these terms, but looking at parallel terms, um, you find that the prejudices that you have um, often don't apply. Um, there are many other expressions in the same categories as terms like this that are not disliked to this extreme extent. Uh, for example, instead of at the end of the day, you could say, you know, in the end, you could say in the final analysis, which sounds a bit buzzy, but is, is, does not appear on lists of words that people hate, uh, you know, when all is said and done, things like that. Um, so there are many other options you could use that, that people don't, uh, don't dislike as much, even though they're also, you know, let's say, metaphorical. Um, and you can also analyze you know, the truth of the, of the 
stated dislike of this. So at the end of the day is in fact, it is not more common in business than other areas. Um, it is around, uh, it is in fact somewhat less common in business than other areas. It's just that when you encounter things like this, you say, oh, that's a business term, that you know, government employees use that, um, sports announcers, another, you know, or teenagers, other disliked group who use things that, you know, that people don't like. Um, but you can study this, you can look it up systematically, you can, you know, get a random sample of examples and count how many of these are in business senses and uh, um, and you know very often they're not so you know, so these are prejudices and their wrongness doesn't matter you know as with other prejudices let's say you know New York is particularly violent or dangerous um, or you know members of some disliked group whether it's a race or social class or, pe or people from a particular region are less intelligent than uh, than the speaker uh, you know the fact that they're um, you know these things will will well, will sustain, the prejudices will sustain even if they are not true. Um, so at, at the end of the day, an interesting um, thing, the, this was placed in the OED in the mid-1980s, uh, and the earliest example uh, then, because this is a very hard thing to search for by hand, uh, was only from the early 1970s, but it was described in uh, at that point as a hackneyed phrase. Uh, in fact, uh, now that we have databases that we can search things for, it's much older than that. Uh, we've now found clear evidence going back to the 1840s. Again, same sense, you know, more or less, you know, meaningless figurative example meaning in the end, um, but you know, examples you know, from authors ranging from Disraeli to Auden, you know, ma major writers. Um, it was originally most common in British use, but it's now spread. Uh, and exactly why this one has received so much ire when similar phrases um, have gotten off scot-free is unclear, but that's just the way things work. You know, you dislike things, you can't necessarily predict why that's going to be the case. Um, as Hamlet once said, no, there, are, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Um, so, and even so, uh, in the case of the, the Dilbert manager here, um, sounding like a manager is in fact something that one has to do. Um, you know, avoiding things, you know, say, saying things you don't really mean, you know, this is something that humans need to do from time to time. So, uh, you know, rejecting it merely because it's management speak isn't necessarily bad. You know, you have to, um, you know, you have to do what you have to do. Um, so. Uh, I can't conclude with any strict advice. I mean, uh, we've seen that Atlanta is a beacon of both despair and hope, and that we need both resilience and control. So um, in terms of buzzwords, you know, if things are buzzwords for a reason, that's great. If they're buzzwords that, that are not for a reason, that's also great. I mean, we just have to deal with it. People will use things they, uh, uh, they use, and people will dislike things they use, regardless of you know, any kind of systematic way we can examine it. And uh, you know, the language evolves in a way that is useful to the people who use it, and that's uh, pretty much the way language works. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>